and I will pass it over for uh, Dr. Steve Semkin, and I'll try to pull up your presentation as well, Steve. Um, he's our resident geologist on the project. He's a professor of school of the ASU School of Earth and Space Exploration, and um, an awesome guy to work with. Uh, Steve, uh, confirm, is that looking okay? Yep, That's you got okay. it. Let me let you take it over. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Tech, are we good on the microphone? Good. Thanks, everybody. Again, I want to thank Matt for inviting me to come along on this amazing adventure, and to all my colleagues, and especially to Peyton, who I'm proud to say is my student, and uh, yay, and has done an amazing job. Uh, so yeah, this is I'm, I'm a geologist in the School of Earth and Space Exploration here at ASU, um, which is one of the co-sponsors of, of this project. And I want to shout out to my director, uh, Professor Minnie Wadwa, who uh, supplied some funding to help support this. So I'm going to be talking about the geologic history and the geoheritage of the Grand Canyon District. So I'm going to actually kind of get away from the, the book a little bit more toward the canyon itself, since really that's the subject here. And uh, I don't know how many people recognize that, but that title slide is patterned after the dust jacket of the 2001 version of the, uh, of the uh, monograph that, that Steve Pine actually wrote the foreword to. So what is the Grand Canyon District? I mean, we, we, we talk about the Grand Canyon. We talk about different sort of geographical terms. Dutton described the Grand Canyon District as the region which drains into the Grand and Marble Canyons of the Colorado River of the West. So this is a relief map of the entire Southwest. Phoenix is right down over there. That's where you are right now. And uh, if you've traveled around the Southwest, you know that it is great there's great topographic diversity. The lay of the land varies greatly, and that is essentially a, a, a manifestation of the great geologic history that this region has undergone. When, we, when a geologist looks at that kind of variable topography, we get really excited because that tells us that a lot of changes have happened, a lot of different processes. And there's the Grand Canyon right up there. You can see it there. So it's in the Colorado Plateau, which is the, the large high elevation, mostly low relief, meaning mostly flat region of high desert region of the sort of centered on the Four Corners area. So that's really when we talk about the, the Grand Canyon District, that's really what we're talking about. And I'm going to talk about the geologic history of that canyon and that region of the Colorado Plateau around there. What, what is the story that's actually recorded in the rocks that are exposed there? And I'm now going to allow you to summarize my entire talk in four words, okay? So I want everybody to repeat after me. Old rocks, young canyon. My work is done. Thank you very much. Now, I've got a little more to talk about here. But before I do get into the geology, I do want to acknowledge that the Grand Canyon, the area the Grand, we call the Grand Canyon District, both was and is indigenous homeland. And my colleague, Sarana Riggs, is going to talk much more eloquently about this than I possibly could. But I do want to put this map up here to show the 11 indigenous nations that live today in and around the Grand Canyon area and for whom this has always been homeland. So I want to, I want to acknowledge that before I get started. So just a little bit about the physical nature of the Grand Canyon. How many people have been there? Good, many of you, that's great. Almost all of you have been there, right? Whether you've been down in the bottom or up on the rim, any way you look at it, it's pretty spectacular. So the Grand Canyon is a canyon of the Colorado River, and there's some stats on it. It's 277 miles or 446 kilometers long if you follow the channel of the river. Typically, the starting point, which you call mile zero, is Lee's Ferry, Arizona. It's right up where Navajo Bridge is, if you're familiar with that. And the mouth of the Grand Canyon, it, it, it debouches. That's a great geologic term. It comes out of a wall of cliffs at a place called the Grand Wash Cliffs, 277 miles downstream. Along the way, there's some uh, areas that are interesting, like the confluence, where the Little Colorado River comes into it. Um, the Phantom Ranch here. Uh, then on either side of the canyon, on the Kaibab Plateau here, we have Grand Canyon Village. Most people come to Grand Canyon, they go there. Uh, people who visit the North Rim, they go up there. And then if you've been to the Hualapai Skywalk, it's actually way down here in a side canyon, very near to the, to the other end of the Grand Canyon. Um, along the way, it descends, the river descends from about 3,100 feet above sea level to 1,200 feet above sea level. It's important to note that even though the canyon's about a mile deep, the bottom of the canyon is still pretty high in elevation. I mean, the Colorado River still has a long way to go before it gets out to the Gulf of California. But typically, it's about a mile deep. And the other thing to keep in mind that probably a lot of people know is that, in general, the North Rim is higher in elevation, with an average elevation of about 8,000 feet. 
than the south rim. When you're standing at the south rim, you can actually look up sort of at the north rim. I've got a friend who's a pilot, and she had a small plane. She's a geologist, too, actually, and she flew across the canyon one time, and she said it was actually kind of interesting challenge when she flew across from the south rim and had to climb to get up over the north rim and, and really noticed that. It was really pretty significant. Before I actually talk about what we're going to the history, I want to just sort of make a brief aside. How the heck do we know this? How do geologists know what we're about to talk about? How do we deconstruct the geologic history as that's recorded in rocks? I don't have a lot of time to go into these in detail, but you can read these for yourself. These are the various tools that geologists deploy to try to deconstruct rocks, to understand the stories that rocks are telling us. Based in the field, we, we do work in the field, but we also do work in the laboratory. We measure physical and chemical properties of rocks. We look at fossils, which are records of past life and the environments in which they lived in. And more recently, we can look at larger areas of the Earth, very conveniently, from satellites using remote sensing. And we can actually model, we can use computers to simulate a lot of Earth processes that give us very realistic simula simula uh, sorry, simulations that you know, we consider to be accurate representations of Earth processes. And when we do that, what we find basically is that the Earth is a very dynamic planet. If you look at other bodies in the solar system, they're not nearly as exciting as the Earth is in many ways. We have this constant interplay of the Earth beneath our feet and the sky above our heads, Earth and sky. Beneath our feet, the solid outer layer of the Earth is broken up into pieces that we call plates, and they're shifting around. They're moving around, bumping into each other, pulling away from each other in places. And that's what we call plate tectonics. Maybe you've heard that expression. That is the, that is the way that the Earth's outermost rocky shell, broken into pieces, is actually moving and, and causing geological processes to happen. So plate tectonics builds continents. It opens up ocean basins. It throws mountains up into the sky. It, it creates volcanic activity. But at the same time, we have an atmosphere, and we have water on the planet. And they, as they move across the surface, they kind of counteract what the solid Earth is doing, and they grind all of that down. So there's constant interplay between forces that rise up the land and wear it back down again. And the Grand Canyon is like a perfect example of that kind of duality of processes, as we're going to see. Because again, we have old rocks, young canyon. We have this pre-existing stack of rocks that the Colorado River has cut through deeply and exposed. So. <coughs> I'm really pleased to say I was part of the team that developed the Trail of Time at the Grand Canyon, which is essentially a self-guided geology field trip along the South Rim. If you haven't experienced it, next time you go to the South Rim, you really ought to. Check it out. Um, this is one of the views from the Trail of Time where you can pretty much see the entire sequence of rocks in Grand Canyon. And this is Dutton's day, so I promise not to spend too much time talking about John Wesley Powell, but there is a quote that I think he had that really sort of aptly describes this. And he said, all about me are interesting geologic records. The book is open and I can read as I run. And that analogy between layers and pages of the book is, is something that I think geologists, we call ourselves deep historians in a way, because we're, we're interested in history too. Geology is a historical science. We just maybe have a somewhat different time scale. But, but we look at these layers as, as pages in a book. And uh, here, is our, here is our young canyon cut into very old rocks. And a principle of geology is basically the stuff at the bottom is older than the stuff at the top. So the really old rocks are down below. The younger rocks are up there. But even the rocks up here are still fairly old when compared to the canyon. You know, when you look at this and you see all these different beautiful colors and cliffs and slopes, and you know, it may be kind of hard to make sense. There, there are many, many, many different parcels of rock, layers of rock that each have their own little story. But what we can do is we can look into the canyon and we can, we can see that there are patterns there. Okay, if we, if we look at the rocks in the canyon, we can see, for example, that down in the depths of the Grand Canyon, we have rocks that have no layers. We can see layers up here. We can't see layers down there. And if we look at those rocks closely, we see that they're actually made of crystals. They're made of mineral crystals. They, they look like, you know, they're sort of put together like a sugar cube, if you will. Whereas a lot of these layered rocks are made of, of materials like sand and mud and lime that have been cemented together. And the layered rocks are sitting on top of the crystalline rocks. But some of those layered rocks are tilted, and some of them are flat-lying. So I'm going to walk you through the history of the Grand Canyon, the geologic history, sort of by looking at these groups of rocks, these parcels of rocks, if you will, each in their own order, from the oldest to the youngest. 
So this is a nifty little cross-section that my colleagues Carl Karlstrom and Lori Crossy at the University of New Mexico, both, both really distinguished Grand Canyon geoscientists, created. And essentially, that is what you're seeing. When you're looking into the canyon there, you're basically looking from up here down in that direction. And you can see from the colors and the patterns, here they are. There are the, the unlayered crystalline rocks down here. There are the layered, tilted, the tilted layered rocks there. There are the flat-lying tilted, uh, sorry, flat-lying layered rocks on top of that. And we have obtained ages for these rocks. And when we do, we find that the total age, the oldest rocks down here are just a little bit shy of 2 billion years. And they go right up to rocks that are forming today in certain parts of the canyon. So we have a rock record here that's almost 2 billion years old. But the thing is, it's not continuous, because there are always times in Earth history when rocks are not being laid down, or maybe rocks are being worn away by erosion. So we have gaps in the record, and that's what these little black bars over on the right here indicate. This is a column. This is the, the geologic time scale. We've organized the age of the Earth into this group of, of names. It's kind of like a calendar, if you will. You know, we've, broken up, we've broken up geologic time into eons and eras and periods. It's kind of like seasons and months and weeks and days, the same sort of thing. And I'm not going to burden you with these terms right now. We don't really need them to talk about what we're doing here. But I want you to see that everywhere there's kind of a black box there, that is an interval of geologic time where there's a gap in the rock record. We don't have any rocks from that time interval in the Grand Canyon. And we call those gaps unconformities. They're, they're places like we, we'll find two layers on top of each other where one layer is going to be significantly different in age from the one above it. And the time in between is not represented by any rocks. And Grand Canyon has that. So essentially, that analogy between rock layers and pages of the book is good, except in the case of geology, typically half or more of the pages of the book have been torn out and they haven't been torn out in, they've been torn out in random places, okay? So imagine the tertiary history, uh, this is sacrilegious, but imagine half the pages torn out of that in different places, like maybe 10 pages here, five pages here. Then you put it back together again and you have to make sense of it. That's what we do, but that's the challenge and that's what makes geology so much fun. And the biggest gap is the one right here that where we have rocks that are almost 2 billion years old and overlying them are rocks that are about 500 million years old. Okay, that's a lot of time in both cases, but you can do the math. It's about 1.2 billion years of missing time, or 1,200 million years of missing time in that interval, and we call that the great unconformity, and I'll come back to that. That term, we have Clarence Dutton to thank. He was the one who first coined that term. So I have taken that diagram that you saw there, all those different rocks, all the names of the different rock formations are all present there. I've broken it up into our group. So we have the unlayered crystalline rocks, which we call the basement rocks. They're at the bottom. They go from about 1,800 to about 1,400. Rather than go from billion to million, we just tend to use thousands of millions when we're talking about billions. So there's that easy transition. So yeah, that's really 1.8 to 1.4 billion. And then the tilted layered rocks, they go from about 1,300 to about 730. Then the flat-lying layered rocks from about 520 to about 270. And then we actually have some very geologically recent volcanoes that erupted at the top of the canyon, and they're all less than 10 million years old. And I'm going to look at each one of these packages of rock in its turn, but also let's keep in mind that our geological understanding of the canyon itself is that it is a mere 6 million years old. Okay, so you got rocks that are 1,800 or more million down here, but the canyon's only been around for about 6 million years. Okay, and again, that basic principle of geology is that we call it superposition. The stuff at the bottom is older than the stuff at the top. So we're going to start with the oldest stuff at the bottom, that's the basement rocks. So we're going to look again into the Grand Canyon, and we're going to focus on these first, these unlayered crystalline rocks. Now, we get a great view of them from the rim, but there's no substitute for actually going down into the canyon itself and seeing them. And so here we go. We're the basement rocks or the deep. So we call them basement. They underlie everything else. So it's like the basement of your house, if you will. 1,800 to 1,400 million years old. Most of them in the range of about 1,700 to, to 1,600. Um, and we go down there. So this is, a, this is a picture I took on a river trip down at the bottom of the canyon. And we're looking at those basement rocks. And my goodness, those are mangled rocks. Look at the way they're just kind of waves. And they're, they're, they're folded and twisted and torn about. And you can't do that to rock unless you bury it really deep and subject it to a lot of pressure and heat it up pretty much too so it'll flow. 
So these basement rocks are very dense. They're hard rocks. They're crystalline. They're contorted. And they tell us a story of being buried very deep in the crust and being squeezed by the enormous pressure of all the rocks above them and all the rocks on either side kind of closing in on them. And we call those metamorphic and igneous rocks. And here's how Dutton described them. Dutton said, granite. Now, the granite is one of the rocks here. There are other rock types beside granite. But he called it all granite, which is what Powell did too. Um, granite of a dark iron gray shade, verging, verging toward black and lending a gloomy aspect to the lowest deeps. Now, a lot of geologists would challenge that gloomy thing because these are some of the coolest rocks in the Grand Canyon. But anyway, that's what, that's what Dutton said. So, so what, are, what story do they tell? How do, we, how do we get that kind of pressure and that kind of heat? Well, that's a story of the actual building of the continent. Because what that story tells us is that if we go back before the time of those rocks, there was no Arizona. The continent did not extend that far south. Much of what is now Arizona was still the floor of the ocean. And it was put together by the gradual assembly of chains of islands and fragments of old continents that were moved into place by plate tectonics and basically collided with the edge of the ancient continent, which we call Laurentia. That's sort of the predecessor to North America. And gradually built that continent out over several hundred million years. And in the process, Everything got squoze and heated and big mountains were thrust up because that was, that was a tremendous process. But it took hundreds of millions of years to happen. So it's like this chain collision on the freeway that took a long time, several hundred million years to happen. And if you today, if you go and look at Australia and you look to the north of Australia, you see the island arcs of the, of the uh, Indonesian nation. And right now what's happening is... is, is uh, um, Australia and Indonesia are coming together pretty much the same way we think happened in Arizona back much longer ago. So the assembly of the continent was the story, and that's basically what it did. Plate tectonics took these smaller land masses, crunched them all together to make big land masses, thrust up a giant mountain range, which we call the Vishnu Mountains. They're long gone. And the rocks we're looking at today were down here. They were down below all those mountains. They're about 12 miles beneath the surface. So all that overlying rock has been eroded away in the, in the interim. And what we're looking at here is just the product of these enormous collisions and, and, and tremendous heat. So every time you see this picture from the monograph, that means I'm going to jump ahead to the next group of rocks. And the next group of rocks are the tilted, layered, supergroup rocks. And they're really different. They're really different from the basement rocks. And they're a little bit younger than the basement rocks, but not by a whole lot. They're about 1,300 to about 730 million years ago. And you can't actually see them throughout the Grand Canyon. They're only exposed in certain parts of the Grand Canyon because they were only preserved in like small little places all across the southwest. But again, this view from the Grand Canyon, that's Plateau Point right out there. Some of you may have hiked out to there. The Bright Angel Trail goes down this way, down to the river. You see there's a little bit of the river right there. But there are the supergroup rocks. They're sitting on top of the basement rocks, but they're layered, but their layers are tilted. They're not flatlined. They're tilted layers. And when we go down the river level, it's a picture I took near the infamous Hans Rapid, which is one of, the, one of the wildest rapids on the Colorado River. But it's also a place where you can really see those supergroup rocks. Look at those layers. Oh, the reds. I mean, they're just magnificent in color. They are layers of limestone, sandstone, mudstone, lava. They're really different from the basement rocks because they're made of... They're made of particles of sand and mud that were deposited at or near the surface rather than deep down in the crust and then cemented together to form rock. And that red color comes from small amounts of what is essentially rust, iron oxide. You know rust is red colored. Less than 1%. Doesn't take much to make them really red. But the fact that these are layers of sedimentary rock that were deposited at or near the surface and they're tilted, that, that tells us something. Okay, what we think the story they're telling us here is, okay, we've come enough, farther enough into the present that Southwest is finished. The, the crust of the Southwest, the basement rock, has been completed, but plate tectonics is not done with the Southwest because what it was doing is it was adding other land masses to our south and throwing up this enormous mountain range which basically extended all the way across from what is now Arizona all the way across to what is now New England and Atlantic Canada. And that's called the Grenville Mountains. That would have been like a Himalayan scale mountain range. Really, you know, that's what's amazing is that we had these enormous mountain ranges 
and they've been eroded away in the, in the great depths of geologic time. And the process of assembling all of this together actually brought all the continents of Earth together in one large landmass that we have named Rodinia. It's a supercontinent. Several times during the history of the Earth this has happened. The continents come together, and then they're broken apart, and they drift apart. And where we are right now, they're all pretty much apart. But at some point in the geologic future, they're going to come together again. And when the Grenville Mountain Range was thrust up, that was sort of south of the, of the modern-day Arizona, the southwest. And, and what it did, essentially, is that collision exerted stresses on the crust of Arizona that essentially pulled it lengthwise. It pulled it sort of horizontally, and it broke it up into these basins and mountains, which are probably not very different from the kind of basins and mountains that we see in southern Arizona today. So in a way, you can kind of envision this is a lot like what southern Arizona looks like today in, in some ways. And so you opened up these basins, you open up these sort of cracks in the earth where the, the earth would kind of, the, the crust would drop down, forming like a valley, like a rift valley in which the sediments could be deposited. But since they were settling, they didn't settle evenly. One side typically would kind of settle down a little faster than the other. And so the sediments deposited in them, they start out being flat, but through time they kind of tilt, they kind of dip. And that's how these rocks we think became dipped. So these basins were, were there in the mountains, and, and some of the sediment in those basins came from the Grenville Mountains, and some of them came from the sea, which was sort of on the, the western side of all this as it was happening. And this is what formed these tilted layered rocks, which we today call the Grand Canyon Supergroup. Now the other thing is, at that time, there was life on Earth, but it was not really what we know today. The only kind of organisms that were really dominant at that time were microbes. And so they formed these colonial structures that we call stromatolites. And they're not that common on Earth today, but they were really the only thing going back 1,300 million to 730 million years ago. And we can find their fossils in the rocks of Grand Canyon. We can find, like for example, this is really cool. This is a stromatolite that's called Boxonia. And the, the, the Microbes, the, the, uh, the cyanobacteria, as they will, would essentially form these colonies that assume these large shapes that look very much like brains. And they kind of fall out of the cliff. And you can see how big they are. That's a rock hammer. So that, that thing is probably about eight or nine feet across. And these things would weather out and kind of tumble out of the cliff. And that cliff where they're all set, we call that the brain bed. It's pretty kind of cool. Here's another type called Inzeria, where they form like little lumps on the surface. So we have fossils from really, really early forms of life there at that time, but really not much else. All right, let's move ahead now to the flat-lying layered rocks on top of the supergroup rocks. Again, we're jumping ahead in geologic time. We're talking about rocks that are about 520 to 270 million years old. So we started out at 1800, and now we're up to 520. So we're, we're moving pretty fast through geologic time. And we call them the Paleozoic rocks in part because they were all deposited during the Paleozoic era of geologic time, which is one of those intervals of time. It was the time before the dinosaurs appeared, if you will. It was a time that was dominated by other forms of life, like fish and amphibians and, and creatures on the seafloor and different kinds of plants. Okay, So one of the things we see, I remember I told you about the great unconformity. This is where the greatest of great unconformities is, where we have these Paleozoic rocks, places where the, where the supergroup is not present. We actually have the Paleozoic rocks sitting directly on the basement rocks. So this is the oldest basement rock in Grand Canyon. It's called the Elves Chasm Nice. It's about 1.84 billion, 1,840 million years old. And on top of it, we have a Paleozoic sandstone, a flat-lying sandstone that's 508 million. So there's 1,332 million or 1.332 billion years of missing time represented by that surface. And that sure is the great unconformity. So again, thank you, Clarence Dutton, for coming up with that term. But the Paleozoic rocks, in a way, they're, they're similar to the supergroup rocks in that they're also sedimentary rocks. They're limestone, mudstone, sandstone. But there's this big stack. This is really what makes up much of the, the cliffs of the Grand Canyon. Much, much of the, the height of the Grand Canyon is taken up by these Paleozoic rocks. Although, actually, if you took those supergroup rocks and you flattened them out, if you took the tilt and laid them straight, they'd be thicker than the Paleozoic rocks. But still, they're pretty thick. And, and here's how Dutton described them. He said, the color effects are rich and wonderful. They're due to the inherent colors of the rocks modified by the atmosphere. The total effect of the entire color mass is bright and glowing. There's nothing gloomy about it. So obviously, he was definitely much more in favor of Paleozoic rocks than basement rocks. OK, to each their own, I guess.
All right, so how do you get those? Well, you get those from being deposited on the surface. And a limestone is typically deposited under the, the seawater, and sandstone and mudstone typically deposited in more dry environments, sometimes even deserts. So what we think is that at that time, those old mountains that we saw before were all worn flat. Arizona was now a pretty flat place, and it was low in elevation. It was low enough that when you had sea level rises, which happened sort of as a natural consequence of, of things like glaciers melting and freezing, when the sea would rise, it would flood across Arizona and drop lime and mud, and you get layers of limestone and mudstone. And then once in a while, you get a change in the climate. The sea would, would lower, the sea levels would lower, the sea would recede, and then you get deserts that form there. And so you get sand dunes forming, and you get layers of sandstone. And that, that kind of alternated back and forth, back and forth through this early and middle Paleozoic. And the other thing that was interesting is we think that, that as we got sort of later into the Paleozoic, there were, there were mountains to the northeast of, of Arizona, which we call the ancestral Rocky Mountains, and they were actually shedding some sediment down into the Grand Canyon area at that time, too. So that's what was going on with those rocks. And so layers of sediment accumulated atop ancient Arizona for hundreds of millions of years and were gradually cemented into rock. So there are basement rocks, there are the layered rocks, and we think that there are actually a bunch of other rocks that were deposited there that are no longer present in Grand Canyon, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But these rocks, since we're moving forward in geologic time, they're now encoding more complex life, like these are the burrows of, of worms in a, in a beach. There's a trilobite, a little organism that crawled on the seafloor. We had plants, and eventually we had vertebrates. And these are the tracks of what are called a reptiliomorph, Chilichnus. They're in the Coconino sandstone, which is one of these beds in the, in the uh, uh, Paleozoic rocks that's about 280 million years old. So life is getting more complicated. We're still not getting to the point where we have the life, of course, that we have today. And we don't even have dinosaurs yet. Okay, the dinosaurs came a little bit later than that. All right, so that's pretty much, that's most of the rock record. There's some other rocks we'll talk about in a moment. But here's the real question, right? These rocks... They had to have been deposited at or near sea level, particularly the limestones, right? The sea had to be there. And yet today, these rocks are more than a mile high in places. Grand Canyon is high elevation, particularly the rims. How did that happen? How were they uplifted so high? Well, it's plate tectonics once again. Geologists, we think that what was going on at that time was that North America was riding over the sea floor coming in from the west at a fairly shallow angle. And that was taking the crust and squeezing the crust. And like happened other times before, it lifted everything up. We had mountains forming again. We had Arizona was very rugged and mountainous. And pretty much the entire southwest was lifted up high, including the modern-day Colorado Plateau, where the Grand Canyon is today. All right. So the entire future southwest, which had been low-lying, is now high in elevation. I want to shout out here. I've shown you several of these. These are paleogeographic maps that were created by uh, Dr. Ron Blakey, formerly of Northern Arizona University. These are artistic and scientific representations of what we think the Southwest looked like at different intervals of geologic time. So this is what we think it looked like about 60 or 70 million years ago, something like this. We had a mountain range to the south here. We're sort of through central Arizona called the Mogollon Highlands. The Colorado Plateau is now starting to come up, and we had Rocky Mountains, newer Rocky Mountains, forming to our northeast. Okay, so Dutton, Dutton saw this. Dutton saw that there had to have been uplift. The canyon wouldn't be here if it wasn't for uplift. And so here, as he put it, it was the only rational conclusion left us is that the Grand Canyon platform has been raised since the Miocene, that's since about 10 million years, by an unknown amount, though a part of that amount is directly indicated in the displacements now observable on either side of it. Actually, the uplift started a little sooner than that. But this is why the younger rocks that we think were deposited are no longer there. The, as, as the plateau came up, erosion was busily grinding away at the top of those layers and working its way down, even as tectonics was pushing things up. Remember that interaction between Earth and sky? So rocks younger than the Paleozoic may have been present before, but they're no longer there at Grand Canyon. They are present in other parts of the Colorado Plateau. If you go up to the Arizona Strip to the north, you go to the east into New Mexico and easternmost Arizona, you will find those younger rocks. And in them, you will find dinosaur fossils, because they are Mesozoic rocks, which was the time of the dinosaurs. But you will not find dinosaur fossils at Grand Canyon. I know that, that uh, disappoints a lot of people, but all the rocks that remain at Grand Canyon today from those layers are too old for dinosaur fossils. All right, 
So now we have, to, we have to make Grand Canyon. Now it's time to actually talk about Grand Canyon. And in order to get Grand Canyon, we have to have a gradient, right? We have to have a way for the Colorado River to flow from high to low. And that happened about 35 million years ago. We had new changes in the plate tectonics. And basically, southern and western Arizona dropped down in elevation. It stretched and it subsided. And so we had the establishment of the, of the topographic break that we have today in Arizona, where northern Arizona is high and southern Arizona is lower. And that provided that gradient for the Colorado River to flow. And so that allowed modern river systems of the southwest to, to develop their drainage systems, the Rio Grande to our east and the Colorado River, uh, which came through Grand Canyon. And it did so in part because the, the mouth of the river, which we call base level, lowered in elevation that basically the river wanted to flow down toward that and so the rivers will start to cut headward as a river starts to flow it will cut into its headwaters and advance to the north um, but there were also probably some smaller canyon sections that were already there maybe ancient rivers at earlier times that the colorado river used as sort of a convenient pathway and it linked up those older canyon sections so that by about six million years ago we had the Grand Canyon, okay, the thorough, the through growing Grand Canyon complete by about six million years. That's what the evidence suggests. So there's that young canyon through old rocks. This is a trail of time sign that kind of shows that. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind is what the river basically does is it cuts the canyon down. The Grand Canyon region is, you know, wide and there are lots of little side canyons and so on. That's the tributaries flowing into the Colorado River that kind of widen it and they create steep slopes that are then susceptible to landslides. And so the lands together, the tributaries and the landslides are actually what make the entire canyon into the wide features. You know, it could be 10 miles wide in some places. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, I know I'm running over, but I know we have a break, so sorry about the break, but uh, is the basalt volcanoes. That, that, that after all of this other stuff, and even after the canyon itself was formed, we had volcanic activity all across the state of Arizona. And some of it, these areas in red, are volcanoes that erupted within the last four million years, which would make them younger than Grand Canyon. One of them is in the San Francisco volcanics by Flagstaff, Sunset Crater, which erupted in the year 1082. Some of you may know that's the youngest volcano in Arizona. But on the north rim of Grand Canyon, we have a volcanic field called the Uincaret volcanic field, which was equally young. One of the eruptions there was, was, at least one of the eruptions there was known to the Paiute people who were living there. They observed it. So these are pretty young eruptions. And what they did was essentially they flowed into Grand Canyon. You had eruptions along the rim. The lava would flow, and for a time, you'd have a natural dam. The lava would form a dam, and you'd get these big dams that you know, even made Glen Canyon and Hoover look like nothing. And the river would back up, but, but eventually the river would cut through them and remove them. And so these dams are ephemeral. And the good example of this, this is a cinder cone right on the north rim called Vulcan's Throne. And you can actually see the remnants of the lava flow, that, several lava flows that flowed into there. At one point, they filled the canyon. And today, you can actually follow some of those lava flows for like 100 miles downstream from these, from these volcanoes. But the remnants are sometimes interesting because the, the rocky remnants of that flow have created what many people think is the wildest rapid on the river called Lava Falls. Some of you maybe have been through that. And here's how Dutton put it. The spectacle of the lava floods descending from the Uin Caret, as seen from Vulcan's throne, is most imposing. It tells the story so plainly that a child could read and understand it. Whoa, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear what happened here. All right. Last thing is what I want to mention is that Grand Canyon is not just rock, it's water too. Besides the Colorado River flowing through it, there are tremendous groundwater resources. My, my colleague Lori Crossy has studied this for many years. <coughs> She's identified that some of the groundwater in Grand Canyon is basically rainwater and snow melt that percolates down, and some of it's that water coming from great depths. And the water that comes from above, the upper world water, which then kind of passes through porous layers of rock that we call aquifers and kind of follows faults in the rock, cracks in the rock, um, that provides some of the most delicious water. If you've ever had spring water at Grand Canyon, you're drinking that groundwater, and it's really good stuff. Some of the stuff coming up from below is, not, is kind of grungy. You don't really want to drink it. But this is Vasey's Paradise. This is a place where this upper world water is actually emerging at, from springs there and forms these spectacular springs. So it's important to realize that, that Grand Canyon, those layers of rock in Grand Canyon are, are like sponges. They're holding water. And by carving through it, 
the Colorado River has actually exposed a lot of those aquifers, and so you have the water coming out on both sides there. Um, and so on account of groundwater, we're getting new rocks. This is called travertine. This is limestone that forms. It's calcium carbonate dissolved in groundwater. When the groundwater comes out at the surface, it, the, the calcium carbonate comes out of solution, and it forms these new layers of rock. So there's rock forming in Grand Canyon right now, even as we speak. And the Colorado River, well, we could talk for hours about the Colorado River being part of, you know, it, it's one of the most controlled rivers on the whole planet with its dams and reservoirs. And, and Grand Canyon, I mean, this is a wonderful little representation that High Country News did showing the reservoirs as funnels and the dams as valves. And in that case, Grand Canyon is this little section of pipe here between Lake, Lake Powell up here and Lake Mead down there. That's a highly controlled Grand Canyon system. And I, I got to give Powell one more, one more quote. I tell you, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation of water rights, for there's not sufficient water to supply the land. In his day, most people thought, oh, water's not going to be a problem. The more people we bring here, the more rain we're going to get. Rain follows the plow. It's going to be great. But Powell, Powell knew. Powell knew that this was a desert. There's only a certain amount of people that can survive in that kind of desert. So finally, I want to end up with geoheritage. I promised I'd mention that. Geoheritage is a term that we use to describe any kind of geologic areas or features that are valuable in some way, scientifically, educationally, culturally, or aesthetically. And I wanted to point out that um, UNESCO, which is the United Nations uh, Educational and Scientific uh, Organization, it's the, it's the science and education arm of the United Nations, has established a, uh, what they call the, hundred, the first 100 world geoheritage sites, which are considered to be the coolest, best, optimum, most exciting geologic sites on the whole planet. And there are two of them that are in Grand Canyon. One is the Grand Canyon itself, and the other is the Great Unconformity. And my, my good colleagues, uh, Carl Karlstrom and Lori Crossy, are actually on their way to Spain in the next couple of days, where they're going to actually present the Grand Canyon at the great unveiling of these 100 geological heritage sites. So in other words, the geoheritage is, is inarguable. right? The, the, the geology that's recorded in Grand Canyon is absolutely in, uh, inarguable. So, um, here are some websites. Maybe you know you can, might want to take a picture of that, or we'll have it up later. You're, we're welcome to you know some of the sources and so on if you have more information for their exploration. I know I've gone a little bit over. I always do that. Sorry about that, but thank you very much. <laughs>